Hi guys, in this video we'll look at the need for specialisation, specialisations of erythrocytes, specialisations of neutrophils, spermatozoa, epithelial cells, and then we'll finish with a summary. So when we describe cells and draw them in reference to particular diagrams, we often just draw them as these basic spherical structures with a nucleus and various organelles dotted around. This is a nice simplified diagram and it's useful to get some points across, but usually cells aren't shaped like this, they're a lot more complex. This is what we call a general cell diagram, but overall in the body, cells are found to be in lots of different shapes because they have lots of different functions to carry out. And this is particularly the case in multicellular organisms. We have to do many different tasks at the same time throughout the body, and as you can imagine, there are lots of different organs and different tissues through the body, therefore needing different types of functions to be carried out, and therefore the cells in them have specific features to carry out those functions depending on where they are. So for example, to name just a few of the processes that we carry out, we need to be able to reproduce to produce new offspring, we have to protect against diseases, we have to digest food as well. So we have this extensive range of lymphatic tissue, we have nervous tissue, we have digestive tissue, we also have reproductive tissue as well. So you can imagine that there are loads and loads of organs, lots of tissues, and many, many cell types found throughout the body, and each of those cells have to be specialised to do particular jobs. Each of the tasks that we've been talking about requires different proteins, different uses of organelles, and also changes to the cell shapes as well. So for example, adipocytes are cells found in fat, fat cells, which are just generally a round shape and they look quite basic. Whereas we might have a nerve cell, which in contrast has a elongated shape and it has synapses and a long axon, many more mitochondria and other organelles as well. So wherever the cell is, it will be specialized and designed in a particular way to carry out the function that's needed at that place. So for example, sperm cells are a very specialized type of cell. This is one single cell as a spermatozoa, and we'll be talking about this in a bit more detail in a moment, but you can see how many specializations it has adapted to look very different from the basic cell diagram that we used to just draw. Sperm cells have a haploid number of chromosomes, so half of that of diploid, whilst other body cells have a diploid number. So this is just one example of one of its specializations. So the sperm cell has haploid genetics, and therefore when it fuses with an egg cell, it forms a full body cell. So it's just one example to highlight there. Cells in multicellular organisms, like ourselves, have evolved to become more and more specialized to their functions. So obviously, after a sperm and an egg have fused together, they form this zygote. And initially, through division, the cells stay quite basic. But as the embryo develops, some of the cells will start to become more specialized. So for example, some cells will start to become muscle, other cells will start to become skin, others will become part of the digestive tract, etc, etc. So as it grows in size, more cells become more specialized. So let's go through some specific examples of specialization to give you an idea of how animal cells can adapt certain features for their function. So we'll talk about erythrocytes in this slide, which are red blood cells. So cells in the blood are a good example of how cells can be specialized to their function. And the cells in the blood are known as the red blood cells. And these are what we call erythrocytes. And the other types of cell found in the blood are a wide range of different types called white blood cells. So the erythrocytes, as you probably know, or the red blood cells, have the function of transporting oxygen to the cells around the body. So once the oxygen has been breathed into the lungs, it enters the blood capillaries, and in the blood, this then delivers it around the body to be later brought back to release the CO2. Once it's in the blood, the oxygen is bound within the red blood cells, and this is how it's transported. The red blood cells are quite small compared to other types of cells. Therefore, they have a large surface area to volume ratio. So remember, the smaller t things in life tend to have a higher surface area to volume ratio, and this is good because it means that more oxygen can get absorbed into the cell. As you get larger cells, their surface area to volume ratio goes down. So this means that because there's a high surface area, oxygen diffuses in and out very efficiently. We've got a large overall surface area, and so many more opportunities for oxygen to go into the cell 
that's been breathed into the lungs. And obviously we want transport and delivery of oxygen to be very, very fast, and therefore this maximizes that efficiency. The cytoskeleton that's found within the erythrocytes is also very well developed, and it allows the shape to bend as it passes through blood vessels. So remember the cytoskeleton within a cell is a set of filamentous or string-like proteins that span the inside of the cell in lots of different types and directions, and they work together to control the shape of the cell, and they can also influence movement of cells, for example, with white blood cells. So with the red blood cell, we have a particular cytoskeleton which allows it to change shape based on the vessel that it's flowing through. So as we said, one of the important fe features of this is it allows them to squeeze through narrow capillaries. So remember, capillaries are the blood vessels where gas exchange will be happening, O2 will be delivered to the tissues, and CO2 will enter the blood cells or the plasma. So they need to be able to fit one by one so that every cell is able to deliver its own oxygen to the tissue, and therefore it's able to change its shape and squeeze through the narrow vessel. Otherwise, if it was too stiff and rigid, it would just block up the vessel. One example of specialization is also the neutrophil, which is a particular type of white blood cell found in the blood. So here we have erythrocytes, which function in carrying oxygen. And then we have neutrophils, which are a type of white blood cell. And this is again very adapted to its function based on specializations found on the cell. The function of neutrophils is to travel to sites of infection, for example, where pathogens or foreign bodies have entered the body, and they begin to engulf any bacteria or fungal cells that they find. So the neutrophil is this cell here. And once it's used certain receptors to recognize that something is foreign, they then change their shape and basically begin to engulf or encapsulate that pathogen until it's finally contained within that cell in a vesicle. So this pathogen has now been engulfed. Neutrocells are very, very large compared to erythrocytes, which are quite small, because they don't need to enter the smallest capillaries. The erythrocytes need to be able to get into the capillaries to deliver oxygen, but the white blood cells don't need to do this. They are often found entering the larger vessels or leaving the vessels to enter the tissues where infection could occur. For example, if you cut yourself on your skin, neutrophils often leave the blood vessel into the region of the skin, which is now outside of the blood system. And here it will start engulfing pathogens, like we just said before. They travel to these sites of infection by a particular gradient of chemicals or inflammatory mediators, which are released from the site of damage. So for example, if you were to cut yourself or induce some sort of uh, infection, inflammation starts happening at that area. And inflammation releases these chemicals, and these chemicals are known as inflammatory chemicals. And these are very important in guiding the neutrophil to the right area, where it's needed to go and engulf these foreign bodies. This process is known as chemotaxis, and it's possible because neutrophils have several receptors on their cell membrane which respond to these chemicals. So you can imagine that these chemicals are being released from the inflammatory site. And what they're doing is they're binding to specific receptors found on the surface of the neutrophil. And when they do this, the neutrophil realizes they're coming from a particular direction, and it then moves in the direction at which they're binding. Then it's recruited to the site of infection, and it can start working on clearing those infections. And another specialization that neutrophils have is a multi-lobed nucleus instead of a round nucleus. So you can see here that in a normal cell, we have a simple round nucleus, in, usually in the center of the cell. But here we have a multi-lobed nucleus. And so it doesn't have quite a simple shape. The reason it has such a strangely shaped nucleus is so that it can move around more quickly and squeeze into other gaps so that it can also engulf material. So the multi-lobed nucleus allows the cell to kind of change shape as it moves through narrow passages. And it also means that the cell can stick out projections of its cytoplasm to engulf foreign particles, as we said earlier, and the nucleus won't get damaged because if the nucleus was just a round structure, it may get broken and such a change in shape wouldn't be allowed. Another example of a specialized cell is that of the spermatozoa or a sperm cell. So spermatozoa are specialized for swimming and for fertilization. So most cells are sort of drawn in this basic diagram of a round blob with a nucleus. Sperm cells have become so specialized that they look very, very different. So you can see there's the kind of the head region here. And we've got a long 
thin wiry tail which sticks out from the back. The tail is also known as an undulipodium, which is quite a long word, but it's basically a technical name for a tail which allows them to swim through the solutions that they're ejected into. The movement of the tail is quite energetic and requires ATP input, so the sperm have lots of mitochondria in the cytoplasm of the cell. So the tail is obviously here and it will be swimming and moving around. And here we have an area where there's a high density of mitochondria, and that supplies ATP in order to swim. The sperm cells are also very long and thin, and this is ideal because this makes them streamlined. So what streamlined means is that as they're swimming through different fluids, the water is able to pass over their bodies nice and easily, as opposed to a cell which was quite large and wide, the water would impact this and it would slow down the swimming. And obviously the job of the sperm is to try and reach the egg as quickly and efficiently as possible, therefore being streamlined makes it a lot easier to swim through the different solutions. Once a sperm cell has actually swum to an egg cell, or the ovum, it digests the coating on the outside of the egg cell using various chemicals and enzymes. The purpose for doing this is so that the sperm can then inject the genetic material into the egg cell, and then the genetic material of the egg and of the sperm can then fuse to make a zygote. The way that it breaks through the coating is through an organelle called an acrosome. So an acrosome is found in sperm cells and it's this front area here of the head. So this is the acrosome. And the acrosome is basically an organelle which is similar to a lysosome. And the lysosome in most cells is a vesicle which contains digestive enzymes. And in this case, the acrosome contains the digestive enzyme known as lysosome. So here we've got our sperm cell again. This structure is a large lysosome known as the acrosome. And then inside here we've got digestive enzymes known as lysozyme. And once injected onto the egg, these can break through the coating of the egg and then allow the genetic material to enter. So as we just said, as the sperm digests the outside of the ovum, the haploid nucleus can enter to then join with the egg cell to form the zygote. So in the sperm cell, we have half the genetic material the ovum also has half, and as they come together, they then form a diploid cell, and this is the zygote. And that process is fertilization. Another example of specialization for animal cells is in the tissue of epithelia, and these are epithelial cells. So epithelial cells are found on any lining between where the body meets the outside world. So there's sort of the interface between anywhere that's facing the outside environment and the inside environment. So if you imagine a human in basic terms from head through body and then the limbs at the end, a lot of our systems are connected to the outside world. As soon as we open our mouth, the whole of the digestive tract from one end to the other is exposed to the outside world. So the digestive tract is one system which is lined with epithelium other tracts which are lined by this are the respiratory tract, because as we breathe that goes into the lungs. And also the urogenital tract, which contains the urinary system and the reproductive system. So all of these are lined with epithelia. And the epithelial cells are these ones here. So for example, this, the epithelial cells which line the alveoli in the lungs are types of epithelial cells. So what we have here is just a bronchiole dividing down into these bunch of alveoli. And then at the alveoli, all of these sacs are lined by this particular type of epithelium. So in 2D terms, you can think of it as a line of cells, but actually remember the body is a 3D structure. And what you have is this kind of continuous shield of cells, which meets the outside world and the inside world, and it acts as the interface between them. One type of cell which is found in epithelial tissue is called the squamous epithelial cell, and that's found here in the alveoli, as we were just saying. So this particular cell is a squamous epithelial cell. And the specialization of this cell is that it's very thin and it's very flat. And the purpose for this is so that oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse across from the inside to the outside or the outside to the inside, over a very short diffusion distance. So imagine the oxygen is coming into the lungs here through the alveoli, and it needs to get through the epithelium to get into the blood. And as well as this, carbon dioxide needs to come out of the blood and escape through the wall as well. So the wall being very, very thin 
allows a short diffusion distance and therefore maximizes the speed of this uh, transfer. In the trachea we have another type of epithelial cell which are known as ciliated epithelial cells. So these ones aren't so flat and thin but they're designed to have these structures called cilia on the top of their cells or the cells that face the outside world. So the, when we say the outside world this could be facing the airways where the air is coming in. So we have air coming in towards the lungs and the purpose of cilia is to waft things towards where they need to be destroyed, particularly foreign pathogens or dust. So the cilia in particular allow mucus to be moved along the trachea. So they kind of waft together in this synchronized waving pattern and they send the mucus back up to the mouth area to be swallowed into the stomach. And in the stomach, acids destroy all of those foreign harmful particles that may cause damage. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.